<laughs> hey, welcome everybody. Uh, happy, uh, I don't know, what day is today? Octo- it's Thursday. It's October. Today's October. Uh, and I think it's a Thursday. So it's the month is Thursday and the day is October uh, in some, I think it's, I know it's 2020 because it's still crazy out there. Um, thanks for coming. We uh, have seven great companies today to share with you. We pick companies based upon, you know, uh, we like people who make products that customers love. I know that sounds incredibly simple and basic, but when uh, we look at the successful companies that we've invested in and the successful founders we've partnered with, some themes emerge. One of those themes is great product. And another one of those themes is delighted customers. And so we really optimize in the accelerator for that. It's not an incubator. So we're not looking for the raw potential of the founder and then you know a really great idea. We want a great founder who had a great idea and built something and then has the beginnings of traction. And what we found in terms of our investment thesis, and yours might be very different uh, if you are an investor, and your, your thesis might be different. You might uh, want to go earlier and pay a lower price for companies. You might want to go later and have much more uh, traction. We found a Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. And basically that Goldilocks zone is they get a product to market and they get into low thousands, low tens of thousands of dollars in revenue. And then, uh, of course, everybody who graduates from the Launch Accelerator, we participate uh, almost universally in their next round of funding. So uh, that makes us sort of like if you took a Techstars or an AngelList and combined it with a seed fund, um, or I'm sorry, Techstars or a Y Combinator and combined it with a seed fund or an AngelList because we have the syndicate.com behind us with 5,500 members now. Uh, so it's the largest syndicate in the world and uh, we've had great success with it. In fact, the first deal we ever did was com.com, which was a $5 million deal. And now um, I just read today, I can't confirm or deny uh, and don't know. Uh, it, they are raising at a $2.2 billion valuation. So uh, for the investors there, you know, you have to um, take your own counsel on what you're comfortable with. Uh, but what I'm really comfortable with is this type of founder, this type of founder who knows how to build great product and who knows how to delight customers. And a level of focus there uh, is what we're looking for as well. Somebody who maybe takes it seriously. Uh, I find a lot of people don't take the work seriously. And we like people who do really great work and take it serious. Uh, and we take our job seriously. Uh, Presh and Jackie are here with our team. And they work really hard on this program, uh, putting in 60, 70 hour weeks, week in and week out to make it a great experience for founders. And if anybody wants to apply, launch.co slash apply. We pick a lot of companies from founder.university, which there's an application, I think this Friday or next Monday, um, that you can go to founder.university if you know a founder who wants to just to get to know us. Uh, All right. So who's up first, Jackie? We have Palabra up first. Karen. Oh, okay, great. So, um, as I said, we like people who build stuff. And when we saw the crafts, uh, the the craft of this next product, uh, the work that had been put into it, we said, "We got to meet this founder." And uh, she was just dynamic and amazing, and is really customer focused. And we love SaaS products that are elegant and simple and easy to use. Things like Canva come to mind, or Notion. Um, really, or Slack even to to a certain extent, the consumerization of SaaS. In other words, business software that is as elegant and beautiful to use as consumer software um, and simple uh, and easy to get up and running on. So you don't need a you know, two week course and to learn how to use the software. Okay, so here we go. We put three minutes on the clock. This is a trailer of the startup. It's not the entirety of what you would get if you met with the founder. And that is the hope we have is that you meet with the founder at some point, uh, take a meeting and get the 10, 20 minute version of this deck. Okay, Uh, so three, two, go. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen, CEO of Palabra. We make a no-code email automation platform. Let me show you what we do. So this is Chris. Chris started selling nail polish to her friends and one day decided to build an app. This is her app. And this is her first user, Jane. So one day, Chris is trying to understand how Jane interacts with the app. And she learns that Jane usually buys when she recommends her something that that she searched for, but only a few days later. And that 60% of her users do the same. So this is what she would like to do. Every time Jane clicks on an item, she would like to wait for a couple of days and then email her a discount on that product. So she thinks, okay, this looks hard. I'm gonna ask my developer to implement this for me. 
After talking to developers, she learns that this takes a lot of time to build from scratch. And when she tries to solve it with the tools that she already knows how to use, she still depends on developers because she needs all this user data that she doesn't have access to. So it still takes a lot of time and money. So she looks online and finds Palabra. With Palabra, she can connect her app directly to us. That's our app, by the way, uh, with no developers. And every time a user clicks on an item, we receive that action in real time. So she can do things like waiting for a couple of days and then sending an email. So Jane can receive things that are relevant to what she wants to buy and Chris can sell more. If you're wondering how we make these connections uh, to the apps, we have 18 integrations that non-technical people can set up with our developers. And if you're wondering what about the emails, can she edit the emails without developers? She can do that as well. As you can see, she can go ahead and change whatever she needs without developers. And even if she wants to change the logic of what she's building, instead of waiting for a couple of uh, days, she wants to wait for a week, she can do it herself too. And finally, we uh, give her not only clicks and opens for the emails, we give her a user history so she can see everything the users did, not only on the emails, but also in the app. So in short, she gets a tool that's completely no code, no engineering resources are needed, thanks segment for marketers. It's completely self-serve, she can set it up in minutes instead of weeks, and it has a consumer look, so she understands how to use it right away. This is our traction since we launched uh, two months ago. Uh, we went from zero to one KMRR, and we have 700 uh, users. In terms of pricing, we price by data uh, volume, 35, 99, and 399 are our tiers. And in terms of what's next, I showed you e-commerce, but we are fully ready today for SaaS sales. And in terms of channels, we started with email, but uh, we will add SMS, in-app messages, and push notifications shortly. This is our team. We started working on this problem because it was something that uh, a problem that we had ourselves as technical people. Uh, and this is our investors, uh, Jenna Gross from YC and Jason. I'm Karen, CEO of Palabra. We make a no-code email automation tool. Thank you. All right, great job, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> All right, investors. I'm gonna go well around done. and take four or five questions. Um, we'll start with you, Alexandra. A question for Karen. Sure. Thanks, Karen. Um, how are you reaching customers and uh, what's your CAC? And Karen, can, uh, Alexander, can you introduce yourself, please? Um, I meant to remind the investors before you ask your question, could you please tell us your name, your firm, your average check size, and if you have a thesis, please? Sure. Yeah, I'm Alexandra Nicoletti. Uh, nice to meet everybody with Cambridge Creek. We're a VC fund focused on uh, real estate technology. Uh, check size ranges from two to 10 million. All right, thanks so much. Um, Allison, question for Karen. Hi everyone, Allison Williams, New York Venture Partners. Um, we do one to $2 million lead checks. We also do 100K pre-seed investments. We invest in B2B SaaS companies. So question, Karen, great job. My question is, you know, who, what, at what life cycle is your target buyer? And at what stage would you say your buyer outgrows your solution? All right, thanks. Andrew Lee, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, Andrew Lee from uh, Initialized Capital. Um, our average check size is between, I guess, really between 500K and we top out around four and a half million. So generally frequent is like two to three million um, for a seed stage firm. Uh, you might remember us as the honey badgers of venture capital. Um, the uh, question I just have for um, uh, is, is related to sort of the competitive landscape. Um, it seems that the no code world is moving toward uh, a future where the larger platforms who own um, the database, as well as spreadsheets, are creating all the integrations. In particular, um, you know, Airtable, Google, uh, Microsoft's coming out with their own stuff. I would love to hear kind of how you're thinking about that space evolving. All right, thanks. Uh, ben, how about you? Question for Karen? Sure. Ben Narison, I'm a venture partner at NEA. NEA does checks from a million and a half to $150 million. I also, in parallel, have the right to invest my own capital. Actually, don't know if the folks that want to know this, but I did two of the deals out of the last cohort. So question-wise, uh, it really goes to sort of Alex's question at the beginning in terms of how you think about acquisition and CAC, but explicitly how you think about it and if you're working with channel partners as a way to sort of go in through those 18 integrations and acquire your customers that way. All right. Thanks, Ben. Let's take one from our syndicate. Taryn asks, um, what is the product differentiation with tools like MyEngage, CleverTap, WebEngage, and other full stack marketing automation tools? And then we'll 
take those. Ready, Karen? Yeah. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right, so I will start with acquisition, uh, Alex and Ben. So first of all, um, acquisition so far has been organic, so no CAC. Um, and, but that doesn't mean, of course, that we just sit around and wait for customers to arrive to us. Uh, what we have is a monthly goal for new subscribers that we want every month, and we build our strategy from there. So we have a couple of channels right now that we use. Uh, one of them is SEO content, and others are more educational, like workshops. Uh, but uh, one of our channels as well, as you were asking, uh, Ben, is uh, marketplaces. So as I mentioned, we have 18 integrations. So that means um, I wouldn't say 18, but maybe 15 marketplaces like Saviors and others where we appear where our customers are, basically. Um, in terms of um, Allison, you asked about uh, our target buyer. So I would say that... Um, and I think this relates to uh, competition. So our target buyer is the non-technical person in, inside a team. Uh, so that means sometimes the marketing ops person, product person, customer success, and it really depends on the size of the company. So about uh, when does uh, do companies outgrow us? Um, we've talked to companies that are very large, more than 500 employees. And all these companies have the same problem that uh, we are trying to solve, which is um, communication, marketing plus data. Uh, they have this problem. It's just a different role, a different person inside the company that's uh, trying to solve it. And it's usually customer success in this case. So Andrew, uh, about um, uh, competition, I would say um, what I just mentioned, which is uh, our big difference here is that we merge data plus a communication platform. So if you've familiar with the deal from uh, this week to Leo Plus segment, I think that uh, speaks for uh, where we are, which is we're trying to solve uh, all the data from the users, plus uh, all the tools for communication, for sending the emails, for sending the SMSs on the same place. And the difference here for us uh, is that we're not talking to developers. We're not trying to sell this solution to developers. We're trying to sell it to marketing people who are the users of the data. And I think that answers also the, the question from the syndicate about how we differentiate with other marketing tools. Um, happy to answer any more questions in the Q&A. All right, well done. Um, and yes, there are lots yeah. more questions for you in the Q&A box. Um, so feel free to keep answering those, Karen, and in the chat room. And anyone who's asking a question in the box or the Q&A, can you please make sure to tag the company so we, we can get that answer for you. Um, all right, next up will be Shane from Rollbot. Awesome. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to give everybody the little 30 seconds of why we love this company and why we chose to invest. Um, Hiring is hard. <laughs> uh, people need help with that. They always do. And uh, it's expensive. And uh, people want support in doing that. And this one just had delighted customers who were paying a lot of money. And when we see that, we pay attention. Um, and then we saw the product and we're like, oh, that's a product we would like to use. So uh, those things uh, and that our companies would like to use and companies uh, we know have used them and enjoy the product or love the product, I should say. So with that, three minutes on the clock, three, two, go. Great. Hi, my name is uh, Shane Bernstein, founder and CEO of Rollbot. We are an AI powered outbound hiring engine, redefining recruitment, monetizing the handshake. Uh, meet Alejandro. He's a head of HR at Mute6, a Dentsu Aegis company. He and his team are currently hiring for a number of different digital marketing roles with multiple openings across on each. Uh, he and his team, like any company out there, have three options. They can use a job board, which we like to call post and pray. You hope and pray someone applies, but over 75% of the skilled workforce is passive, meaning they never apply. Uh, they could use staffing agencies, but staffing agencies are super expensive and not a sustainable solution. Or they can do it themselves, but lack of bandwidth equals lackluster results. Let me show you how Rollbot works. So we replaced the job description at the top of the funnel. In lieu of a job description, we asked our customers to point ideally to two people that work for them today that they would like to clone. Um, and then we have them fill out a handful of questions that you see here. Um, the data that we get from the questions here is what we use to actually sell and compel the talent pool on their behalf with the end goal of setting up the first interview. Our workflow is uh, to do the sourcing, to do the engagement, and then to set up the final interview or the first interview. Um, in less than 24 hours, we serve the first round of talent um, and um, every subsequent round after that is actually based on what our customers um, are selecting thumbs up to versus what, are, what they're selecting thumbs down to. So they're actually teaching our machine, which is enhancing our AI every round. And then we provide in a transparent dashboard who comes back and says yes, that wants to move forward and set up the, the first interview and who comes back and says no, and we provide the reason why. In under two and a half months, Mute6 has made over 40 digital marketing hires. Uh, Steve, their CEO says, Robot has made an unimaginable impact on our business in the most positive way. Uh, so much so that they've actually recently expressed interest in investing in the company. 
Uh, most of our customers hire one after interviewing up to five candidates. Robot is cutting the time to hire in half. Uh, most of our customers land someone in five to six weeks versus the traditional industry average of, of 10 to 12. Uh, robot guarantees diversity, so we guarantee a third on every set, um, but our customer success uh, percentage today is actually 62% across all roles, all skills, all, cu all customers. And of course, our response rate for the passive talent pool is 30 to 50%. Industry across the board today is under 10, uh, most of the time under five, if any. Unfortunately, most companies are just set up to be reactive, uh, not proactive from a recruitment approach. And we're very proud of our paying customers. 80 to 100% of our customers um, are mid to enterprise level, including ADP, Yelp, Scopely, and USC. Uh, our revenue growth since launch, uh, we launched go to market end of August last year. We saw 10 to, to I'm sorry, 15 to 20% month over month growth through February. Of course, had to make some adjustments for pandemic. Saw some light coming out in August and in September nearly doubled our revenue. And actually in October, we've already hit September's revenue in the first week of October. So our project will actually increase. Uh, our business model, we have two, two, we have an SMB and an enterprise. Uh, the biggest difference in our business model and our pricing models, we charge by the interview, not the placement. So we're 90% cheaper than a staffing agency or more. And of course, our team, uh, I've been in the brick and mortar and uh, software space and the recruitment space for 16 plus years. My co-founder and CTO has been in the B2C, B2B uh, tech space with several exits under his belt. Again, monetizing interviews at scale. My name is Shane Bernstein, founder and CEO of Robot. Thanks so much. All right. Well done, Shane. Okay. Next up would be Jonathan Trias. Do you have a question for Shane? Yeah. And please, um, remember to introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Jonathan Trias from Ludlow Ventures. Um, we're and he's a, awesome. And he invests in a ton of startups and he gets incredible feedback from everyone I sent to him. I get incredible feedback and he's awesome. I think we should keep going. Let's, if you, Jay, like another couple of minutes, Jason, that'd be great. Um, well, I, I need uh, no introduction. Thank you. That was super kind and unnecessary. Um, so uh, first question, Shane, um, is... You know, HR managers get pitched so, 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 so many tools. So how do you kind of stand out and what's already kind of resonated within your sales process? All right, great, thanks. Keith, how about you? Question for Shane. Yeah, hi, uh, Keith from Pair VC here in Palo Alto. We write checks between a couple hundred thousand and a couple of million dollars, just focus on zero to one. Um, thanks, Shane. My question is, is not how you stand out to your customers, but how you stand out to this passive talent pool because anyone who is talented does get bombarded on LinkedIn. And so I'm curious, like what's the secret sauce to increasing that rate from 10 to 30%. All right, great, thanks. Mark, question for Shane, please. Yeah. Hey everyone, Mark Selko. I'm a partner at Costa Noa. I founded two companies before I became a VC. So I know about the life you guys are living. Costa Noa does seed in series A. Um, we're about a million to $2 million check at seed and five to $8 million at series A. And my question, so we've looked at a number of different AI hiring solutions and we've seen a lot of trial, but a lot of them don't stick. What is it about your product that will stick? All right, thanks. And Wayma, how about you a question for Shane? Sure, hi everybody. I'm Wayma, angel investor in Calm. Thank you, Jason, for that. Yum, yum. Yum, um, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> Um, my question is, uh, are there any particular roles that uh, this uh, solution uh, is optimized for? For example, is it good for marketing? Is it good for all roles across the enterprise? All right, great. And let's take a couple from the syndicate. Um, Hanny asks, do you have any direct competitors? Um, and do you, from Anthony, do you have a direct sales team? I'm not sure you'll get to all those, but do your best. <laughs> you have two minutes. All right, let me take it. All right, Jonathan, uh, how do we stand out and who do we target? Uh, so yes, our space is very noisy and crowded and that's actually one of the reasons why Robot got into the space to begin with. There's a lot of noise. It's really just um, uh, kind of jumping on top of what's already out there, job board, sourcing tools. Um, and what we do is, is very unique. So we, we kind of, we're not reinventing the wheel, we're recalibrating, we're taking out some of the antiquated layers, um, kind of um, refining kind of what needs to, what needs to happen and then um, you know, we engage the talent pool. We're setting up the biggest differentiator for us and, and how we stand out is we're, it's by the interview, right? So uh, a certain amount of number of interviews equals a higher, um, three to five for us, uh, uh, for most of our customers. Uh, from a target perspective, um, we target uh, HR and, and stakeholders. So anyone who runs a team, uh, usually at the C-level, uh, they do get a lot of pitches. Um, we, we have two targets. So, I mean, that's our, like from a sales process, uh, usually we do a free, we do a free trial and then, um, you know, we're big, we convert about 80% of our free trials. I hope that answers your question. I can answer more on the Q&A. Uh, Keith, regarding passive talent, our secret sauce is really three pillars. Um, 
cadence is one, uh, highly targeting someone. So we're the first line of prequal. Our customers are the second line of prequal before we even engage in the first place. Um, and then uh, it's really a cadence over about a two and a half to three week time period to get somebody. Most customers, believe it or not, have the opportunity to connect with anyone they wish. Um, the issue is they only reach out once or twice. They never actually reach out after that. So they lose that opportunity, including myself as one of those. Um, so that's our secret sauce is really the cadence, recalibrating the process. Um, Mark, um, what about what, what sticks with robot? A couple things, you know, it's, it's really our, it's our approach. It's how we're recalibrating the process. It's also our, our, our UI, how we actually build a lookalike talent pool based on two profiles. We remove the job description. Uh, we really take that process. We make it very minimal, very uh, low touch for our customer base. Um, and of course we charge by the interview, not the placement. Uh, uh, Memma, uh, role targets, we have six verticals all at the corporate level. Uh, we only touch the skilled workforce. Uh, direct competitors, we have a lot of competitors in the space, uh, but we don't have any exactly direct competitors. We compete with anyone who's vying for opportunities. And then we do have a direct sales team. <laughs> okay, well done. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. Happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> go more specific on the Q&A. Yeah. And th I think there may be some more for you in the Q&A chat box, so you can go ahead and answer those if you didn't get to them. And next up is Carl from Amelia. Um, another interesting company with delighted customers, obviously stress might be increasing for some people uh, from the pandemic, from the racism protests and uh, social justice uh, inequities and an election and, 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 and wildfires and global warming. I don't mean to trigger anybody. Sorry, Jackie. <laughs> Long list of crazy things going on in the world. And um, it's kind of hard to separate work life when everybody's at home working and living their life. And so uh, Amelia has an answer for that. And you'll hear about now in three, two, one. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in. My name is Carl Eckert. I am the co-founder of Amelia, and we're helping companies drive and understand employee happiness. I'd love to show you how this works, so please meet Anna. Anna is the chief people officer at Asana, a paying customer of ours. And in the past, Anna was using apps like Headspace to offer uh, mental health resources to her people. Unfortunately, in the workplace, apps like Headspace tend to have really poor engagement, and there's no way for HR to track outcomes. So Anna ultimately switched over to Amelia because our engagement was three times higher than that of Headspace. This is because of a very personalized and data-driven approach that we're taking to provide the right recommendation at the right time for the right person. So employees can come in, they can pick a focus, they can rate their sleep, rate their stress, and then they get access to three different types of content, meditation, breath work, and yoga. They can also sync a wearable device like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch to see the way that their practice is improving their physical health. And in time, this allows us to develop high quality user data on each person and provide more effective recommendations. What really sets our product apart is the way that we communicate value back to HR. At any point in time, people ops can come in and they can look at metrics that they actually care about, things like user growth and engagement, top programs and priorities for employees, and even changes to resting heart rate and other health outcomes like improvements to sleep. We are definitely in a competitive space, but we differentiate primarily with our personalized approach, the fact that you can sync a wearable and the way that we keep the app free for employees by the way that we communicate value back to HR. Again, we will win the market because our, comp our engagement is three times higher that of the competition. And we attribute this to structural differentiations with the product. Our business model is relatively straightforward. We charge five to $8 per employee per month. And this varies based off company size. We've been super busy since the start of the pandemic. We launched in March and have seen crazy demand for mental health, well, mental health and well-being resources to date, which is evidenced in our month-over-month -month growth. Engagement, again, is what HR cares about the most, and ours is significantly above the industry, sta industry standard of 6%. And this has allowed us to develop a scalable revenue platform where we have doubled our revenue each quarter, and we're expecting to be profitable by 2021. We're working with some incredible brands that care about their people and want to build a better business from the inside out. And the road to 100 million is pretty straightforward if we grow 10x every year from now till 2024. And this is entirely doable. We follow the same go to market strategy that's similar to Slack and other B2B products of demonstrating viral growth 
on the bottom level with the users like employees and then moving forward to HR. So there's a team in the back in the space. It's ours. I'm a former investment banker and my co-founders worked in tech and product at companies like Yelp and a YC back startup. I'm out of time, but thank you so much. And I would love to answer any other questions. <laughs> All right. Well done, Carl. Okay, Paige, a question for Carl. And please introduce yourself first. Great. Uh, I'm Pedro Mora from Rhapsody Venture Partners in Boston. Uh, our typical check size is anywhere from 500K to 2 million. Uh, and we invest mostly in hard tech startups, but we're looking to expand beyond that. So we'll see if there are any that are of interest. Um, so my question is around uh, data security and data privacy for the, for the employees. Um, I think data privacy is probably the only thing that people care about as much as or more than mental health. So my question is, how do you ensure that the employees of these companies are okay with sharing data like heart rate, et cetera, with HR? Thanks. All right, thanks. Thank you. Rachel. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Horowitz. I head up BD and partnerships at Zola and also Scout and Angel Invest on the side. Um, I am curious to hear a little bit more about your go to market motion. Um, wasn't quite sure if it's a sales driven approach or a bottoms up. Um, from the employees. Um, so just curious to hear a little bit about that. All right. Thanks. Scott. Uh, hi, Scott Coleman from Ignition Partners. We invest in seed and series A in B2B software. And our typical check sizes for seed are 500K um, and for series A are three to five million. Um, my question comes to the notion of um, engagement versus impact. And, you know, when an HR department buys software, they tend to start with the notion of engagement, who's using it, how, and so on. But renewals will only happen if there's impact, in my view. And and, and that's why nobody buys software because they want to, they buy it because they have to. And, and so I, I get that you're early in cycle and you haven't had renewals yet, but how do you think of pitching the impact of this to your existing customers when those renewals do come up? All right, thanks, Scott. Um, and Vinny, hi. Hi, uh, I'm Vinny. I'm a uh, angel investor, and uh, you know, just do write checks for two, between twenty-five and hundred k. I've done probably close to about hundred investments uh, so far. I'm also a shark on Shark Tank South Africa, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> um, thanks for the presentation, really great. I, you know, what I see is in the market with uh, these products, and I get a couple of free ones, or I get a couple of the existing ones paid by like affinity programs. I think it was American Express who gave, uh, it was in Headspace or Calm or one of those things free to all their uh, platinum card holders, or whatever it is. And I've seen other programs like that. Do you have, so my question is, do you have any plans to work with affinity programs instead of just companies where they have large swaths of, of users or card holders where they'd be willing to subsidize it and, and pay for it? All right, great, thanks. And syndicate, um, there's a number of <clears throat> questions from the syndicate about these privacy issues. Um, a couple more would be, um, is your current revenue 8K per month or per quarter? That maybe wasn't unclear, that was from Hanny. And Matt is asking, have you had discussion with EAP plans? If so, can you elaborate? It's a lot, but do your best. <laughs> okay, great, yeah. So Paige and everyone else who asked about privacy, this is pretty straightforward. All of our data is aggregated and nothing is individualized. We anonymize all of our data and employees know this from day one. So they feel very comfortable sharing outcomes with us because it's all done on a high level basis. Um, happy to answer more about that later. Rachel, in terms of go to market, uh, it's both sales driven and bottoms up. So, I mean, I'm spending a lot of my time reaching out to HR and, and pitching the value prop of having happier and healthier people. At the same time, I'm getting my friends who work at great companies to download our app and then you use that sort of viral growth as a way to pitch HR and say, look, your people are already using it. You might as well try it out on more of a, at, at scale. Um, engagement versus impact, Scott, totally agree with you. I mean, we used to talk about, you know, on day one with HR teams about, you know, what, what the benefits of better mental health could have for your bottom line and for things like sleep and heart rate uh, and real sort of health driven outcomes. But they were like, yeah, that's great. But first show me that people use this because people don't use your competitors. So if people use you, that's already impactful enough. Um, so that's what we're really focused on. And then we'll start connecting the dots elsewhere. Um, Vinny, do we have plans to work with affinity programs? I think we're really focused on, on the workplace today, but always open-minded when there's a real need to hit and work with other sorts of 
people, but right now it's definitely B2B. Current revenue, it's around 5K per month. Uh, sorry, that was all done on a month over month basis, but our, our revenue fluctuates each quarter based on our sales cycle. Um, we're not working with any EAPs or insurance, but that's definitely in the roadmap for the future. We're really focused on the workplace today. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully that's, I got to everything there, but if not, please ping me and I'll, I'll get back to you. All right. Sounds good. And you'll have more questions there in the Q&A box for you. All right. Next up is Erica from the SIP. Uh, so direct to consumer is a challenging space uh, unless you have really two things. We think a differentiated product uh, that really connects with customers and then a growth minded perhaps growth obsessed uh, founding team. And if you don't have those two things, it's, it's very hard to make it work. When you do have those two things, you can see magical things happen. Uh, and we all know a bunch of D2C brands that have done great. Uh, and so we have been on the lookout for these companies and we saw the SIP and we met the team. We thought, yep, this is a team that has those two qualities and we want to be part of it. So in three, two, go. Thanks, Jason. Hello, everyone. I'm Erica Davis, CEO and co-founder of The SIP. We're building a community powered by subscription and driven by AI to change the way consumers discover and shop luxury wines. The SIP was inspired by my monthly girls' nights with my co-founder and best friend, Catherine. We wanted to discover and try new high-end sparkling wines, but getting our hands on them was harder than we expected. Once we discovered the brands, it was even harder to figure out where to purchase, and oftentimes the price for the wine was too high for something we didn't know if we'd like. We looked around and no one was focused on this problem. They wanted us to do a lot of work and we just wanted to take a sip. So we created a seamless way to discover high-end champagne. With the sip, we allow you to taste a full-size bottle in a smaller format, making this luxury product accessible. We curate six boxes a year where we send six flights of champagne, a custom gift, and a sip guide that helps you understand your palate. The best part, the more you sip, the more you save on a full-size bottle, which sippers can purchase directly from us. Joining the SIP is simple, easy, and fun. Sippers can choose to subscribe by monthly for $59.95 and cancel anytime, or commit to a year with an annual subscription and save. Right now, we're hyper-focused on growth, and a major lever we use is PR. In the last quarter, we've had a ton of press placements, but these aren't vanity points for us. These placements drive 40% of our total sessions. But what we do with those sessions is truly dynamic. They fuel acquisition in three ways. The traffic drops to our site and converts to a subscriber. So a subscriber or a consumer purchases a gift box where we capture their email and funnel them down into our drip campaign to become a subscriber. Then we create a lookalike campaign based on the demographics of the most successful placements. Another acquisition channel is corporate um, gifting. With COVID's impact on corporate employees and cancellation of holiday parties, we see a massive opportunity to take these events digital for these employees and brands. This channel is another lever that allows us to grow our revenue and also convert gifters into subscribers. We're currently at 22,000 in monthly revenue and on track to do 30,000 this month with a 34 blended CAC and a 4% churn. We've shipped over 2,500 boxes to 800 customers and growing with an average 38% month over month subscriber growth. We have two CAC numbers that we really focus on. We anticipate converting 25% of our gifters into subscribers. So in other words, we get them at the lowest CAC and then convert them to lifetime members. The SIP allows us to tap into an unsaturated market to capture the audience base early and win her loyalty. Once we've done that, we really focus on the full bottle upgrade, which is based on consumer reviews and driven by AI recommendations. We'll then be launching the SIP cocktails next year. The upgrade will include a curated cocktail kit owned by the SIP and created to enhance the champagne experience, giving our SIPers the option to personalize, but gives us the opportunity to upsell our customer, expand our product offering, and own our margins. Our path to 100 million will mainly be driven by full bottle purchase, product, and brand expansions. And this is my team. My co-founder and I have been friends for over 10 years. My team has a collective 25 years of experience in merchandise and logistics and marketing. And I'm Erica Davis, CEO and co-founder of The SIP. We're building a community powered by subscription, driven by AI to change the way consumers discover shop luxury wines and spirits. Love to take your questions. All right. Great job, Erica. Okay, investors, back around the horn. Alexandra, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, two, two, two questions. Um, any thought to partnering with uh, apartment communities as a way to welcome new residents? And uh, second question, uh, use of funds for your raise. Okay, thanks. Allison. Hi, great job. You didn't go into much detail about the costs with your business. So how much does it cost? How much does each box cost you? How much does shipping cost? And then also how do you deal with inventory costs? Okay, thanks. Andrew. 
Um, I'm interested to hear um, whether there's a COVID opportunity here. I know that um, alcohol consumption has skyrocketed because everybody wants to drink as much as they can during COVID. Um, but also want to know whether there's an, a CAC opportunity. Maybe there's some decreasing uh, customer acquisition. Okay, thanks. Ben. I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about the AI side. You're trying to match up uh, flavor profiles and sort of how you're building the engine for that, what sort of data you're relying on, where you're getting it. All right, great. Let's take a couple from Syndicate. Todd is asking, um, do you expect more revenue from subscriptions or selling full-size bottles? Um, and Eugene is asking, what is the churn calculated against? You said 4%. Is that per year or per month? It's a lot, but two minutes, as many as you can. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, so I'll answer the churn question right now. Um, it's calculated per month. Um, and so that includes anyone who skipped um, as well as, as an active member as well. Um, Todd, in terms of the more revenue, I actually didn't capture that one. So I'm gonna skip to the top in terms of partnering with communities. So Alexander, in terms of like who we partner right now with in terms of communities, we partner right now directly with brands like LVMH. Um, and we partner with them through a, a media buy and what brands like LVMH care about is our brand exposure and telling deep stories to connect with consumers. They get access to our reach and network of our influencers. And then we align ourselves directly with those brands to use partnerships to activate subscribers. So in terms of where we get most of our growth from in terms of um, revenue, it's really with our corporate. And so to answer the COVID question, that has a great deal to do with it. In terms of how we are capitalizing on COVID as much as I hate to say that, it's really with the terms of like, there's about a 30% increase in consumption in terms of alcohol right now. Um, a lot of that is happening with a lot of corporate um, companies trying to figure out how to actually keep their employees engaged. And a lot of that has to do with um, virtual events. So what we're now doing is partner with them to take those events digital, we capture their information, and then we convert those also into subscribers. Um, in terms of the unit economics, the question about that is, I can give you, sorry, is in terms of unit economics right now, we're at a blend at 57 with the goal to be at 60 by the year. The base of a couple of things, we've negotiated pricing with our third party couriers. So essentially the more we ship, the less we pay. Um, we anticipate getting media buys and brands like LVMH, which in return will pay for subscriptions, bottle costs, and significantly increase our turn. I think I'm out of time, but I'll answer all the rest of the questions in all right, great. Yeah, um, there's a lot more questions for you in the Q and A, and including the one from Todd. And that I may have bumbled that, so sorry, Erica. <laughs> that was my fault. Um, next up is Shun from Remote Hour. Okay. Um, obviously, we're all at home, and we have to take a lot of meetings. And when I saw this product, I was like, "Oh, it's a perfect product for me. I like to make myself available." Um, but part of the problem with making yourself available is that sometimes it's hard to end the call. And they just go on and on and on. So you want to make yourself available, but you don't want to be available for an hour. You probably want to be available for five minutes or 10 minutes to do a quick chat with somebody. And so uh, Zoom meets speed dating uh, in your own private room was just the perfect solution. And when I've used it, uh, it's really been delightful for me as a high extrovert to just meet new people. Uh, <coughs> you know, at five minutes a pop, uh, you know, meet 10 of them. Uh, so uh, again, also a great builder who's moving at a velocity, which is just really, really um, incredible. So Shen, you have three minutes, three to go. Nice and slow. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Okay, uh, I'm Shin, uh, CEO and co-founder of Remote Hour. Uh, Remote is a website that gives the most spontaneous open the solutions to video calls. This is how it works. Uh, meet Shin. He's an investor, and whenever he wants to invest in new startups, he schedules Zoom calls. But Shin is frustrated. His entrepreneurs has to first fill out a form on the website, then book a meeting time with Shin, and you know how annoying that can be. And finally, the Zoom call is set up. This entire process is a waste of the Shin's time. At the end of the month, he only got to talk to two founders, which is not enough. So he chose to start using Remote Hour instead. With Remote Hour, you can set up a room where you, you do three or five minutes of calls and people just queue up and you can just sip through them. The entrepreneurs can with one click connect to him and then they can pitch how the business works instant video chat and screen sharing. 
There is a timer at the top. After five minutes, the call automatically ends. Let me demonstrate how the model works. First, she schedules the day and time he's available on his calendar. Next, he will share his room link with the founders, and then they subscribe his room with their emails. When the office hour begins, his status changes from away to online. When he's online, the subscribers to his room would get email notifications automatically. This is a view of the how the guests call the host. So just one click, the founders that don't need to have an account to talk to Shim, this is why Remodeler is frictionless and seamless. Shim's delighted with Remodeler. He's now talking to eight entrepreneurs per day. This is not per week. That's more than his usual. No more back and forth scheduling. She has saved so much time. Remodeler is a web-based, so Shin can easily share his link everywhere and even, even embed it onto his website. Business model is search. If you use as land of the rooms, they can upgrade our premium plan and instantly access more private room, and it helps them monetize with their paid rooms. Our customers are people want a lot with a lot of the transactions in the day, such as VCs, professors, customer supports, or HR departments. We are really unique in the video call space. Remote is highly personal and keeps you always connected. We launched up middle March and started monetizing and since this June, and our MRR is on the way, but consistently growing. We have three full-time engineers and three freelancers. Thank you, I'm Shum, CEO and co-founder of Remoter. Remoter.com is a website that gives you the most spontaneous open the solutions to video calls. All right, great job, Shun. Okay, investors. Um, David, David, you joined us. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is David. I'm with the SVC. We do, uh, we're based in San Francisco. We do 250K to $1.5 million checks. Uh, thanks, Shun. So it seems like this provides a nice functionality around sort of scheduling that hour or two hour block. Uh, that seems like a nice to have rather than a need to have. How do you see this fitting into somebody's uh, ongoing schedule or ongoing life. Okay, thanks, David. Jonathan, question for Shin? Sure. First of all, I love that you use Shin in your example. I was a Coffin fellow with him, and he's one of the best people on the planet. So please send my regards. He's great. Um, I'm just curious, you know, so like Zoom launched their events management uh, platform today, which killed like 3,000 companies we saw pitch this, this past summer. So I'm curious, like, how you think about um, this this being like a feature versus a product. And if you're concerned about Zoom coming in and launching something very, very similar as a feature. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Keith, question for Shun. Yeah, thanks, Shun. Um, it's crazy that my availability stack has now expanded to something where I realize I have an availability stack. And so uh, just like David, I'm wondering, like, do you need to consolidate? Is there coming consolidation in this sector? Do you need to expand up and down the rest of the calendar? And are there white spaces you think that remain in managing availability that, that wouldn't be contested or that you think you could own? Okay, thanks. So let's take one from the syndicate. Matt, Matt is asking, are you exploring uses in the education system, um, like instructor office hours, for example? So we'll take those. And Shen has an interpreter, so we'll give him a little extra time for those questions to, to come out. And then maybe we'll give him uh, three minutes instead of two. So whenever Shun's interpreter is ready, you can just jump in and answer some of those questions. Hi. Um, thank you so much, David, Jonathan, Keith, and um, uh, the syndicate for asking these wonderful questions. The very important questions, for sure. Well, um, we feel that remote art is not just a nice to have. For many of our target audience, this is going to be a need that we are already witnessing. So for example, because you can like monetize a remote art in a way that you can have paid rooms, we're changing the way consultants work in the field. Telehealth workers, lawyers, uh, personalized trainers like gym teachers or cooks, uh, they can actually use our room to basically have a controlled environment with set amount of time. And they can uh, basically monetize the services online. And you know, COVID has been such a big accelerator in this whole scenario. People like to have, uh, you know, having office hours or the office environment with, where people can come walking into their room and just talk to them or just if they're offering a service, then they can enter the store. 
But as we can see, more and more companies, especially like in the past couple of days, so many companies have been announcing that they're going to be uh, literally virtually uh, working from home. And not only just big companies, a lot of people are deciding to work from home and try thinking of ways on how they can monetize. And so uh, it's it seems like remote hire because it is unique in the whole space where it's personalized. It's about you. It's about um, being always connected and you know. Um, the the scheduling is just so easy we've, we've kind of just uh reduced it to a single step more or less um we feel that it's it's definitely a need to have and it, with that it also brings defensibility uh which um, i would like to answer to jonathan the defensibility of how like zoom cannot just come in and uh, take over our um our type of service that we're offering is because for example when you have vcs or freelancers um they will they have a unique url that they'll be giving to their uh, clients their customers and anyone who they want to interact with on a regular basis and remember these are people who have a high volume of personalized calls we're basically trying to help them um, basically save time so this url is like the unique um, phone number and nobody wants to change their phone numbers all of a sudden so we feel that uh, our our service offers that kind of defensibility with our unique uh, URL and and the, just the behavior of how our customers use. And finally, uh, you know, our um, remote hire has a viral referral loop. So far, we've been just using organic marketing to basically reach out. And every, every customer that we've gotten has been coming from word of mouth. And the fact that the guests who attend our meeting, uh, the, our, our customers' meetings, they don't have to subscribe. So the host, the person who subscribes to remote hire, um, everyone around them who's going to interact with them have to use our service, but they don't have to basically sign up either. So this viral referral loop is um, just absolutely, you know, just boosting our, our users month by month. And we actually have uh, educational users, in fact, users who are professors who are, you know, have open open office hour timings to connect with their <laughs> students uh, and, and, and worldwide around actually. Okay, so, I, I think we're out of time. Yeah. Is that with Prash? I don't think, I think, sorry, that was our fault. I don't think Prash gave you the 10 minute, <laughs> the 10 second countdown, but great job. Okay, next up is Lucas from Tribune. Okay, uh, we've had great success with uh, founders from uh, Australia. They have a certain spirit about them uh, and a certain doggedness, resiliency, uh, and effort that we appreciate. And Obviously, AI is sprinkled on a lot of startups, but uh, a place where you could certainly see them helping is a place where I started my career, which is the help desk in the IT department. And it's too hard to do this for one help desk, but what if somebody made it for all help desks? So with that, three, two, go. Thanks, Jason. G'day, Lucas Mycroft here, CEO and co-founder of Tribune, and we are automating IT support using artificial intelligence. Here are the top common IT issues that occur on a daily basis in every organization globally. And in fact, 70% of what you see on the screen is made up of IT support requests to their help desk organization. Here's a live example. Meet Lauren from Future Fit Out. She runs a construction company. She has urgent deadlines to meet, but her computer is running super slow. So she quickly jumps on the phone and calls IT support help desk for assistance. Then jumps in Ben. He's from Crofty IT Support. He's received Lauren's urgent request, but the thing is, he's got other urgent tasks from other customers at the exact same time. And the systems he's currently using are really inefficient, clunky, and slow. And this is typical in the industry. And IT engineers, honestly, they just don't like talking to customers. They want to get on and solve the problem. So introducing our platform, Tribute, we integrate into particular systems and IT systems globally and Microsoft Teams, as you can see here. It makes it easy for Ben to manage his tickets, automate his scheduling, and communicate with the customer. And the behind the scenes is where our automation really kicks in. And this is the next steps for better customer service. What you're seeing here is our system diagnosing that Lauren's computer's been on for over 13 days. That's just because she likes to close the lid on her laptop. It's understood that information and it's fired that across back to Ben so he can keep going with the job. And this is where really the machine learning kicks in. And this is what we see as the future automation and level one IT support. And in fact, today, we're already saving over an hour per day per engineer. Granted productivity for the engineers and amazing customer service for the clients. We launched in February this year. We're a B2B go-to-market strategy and we've had great monthly growth ever since and all the way through the pandemic. 
we're consumption-based pricing, really similar to AWS and Azure. Our current IT companies are paying on average $100 per month, and we're going to push this up to $2,000 a month, which is the industry standard for IT companies as we build more automation into the platform. The customer usage is a key sticking metric to ensure we don't have churn. As we build more automation into the platform, it actually means that customers use our platform more, which means we make more money. And this is how we're going to achieve our $122 million goal by year six. Our customer acquisition is quite simple. We integrate into IT company platforms. So Datto, who we're currently integrated into, has 20,000 customers we're currently targeting. And then we move on to target the other IT platforms and integrate into them. And then we move on to the enterprise space. Now, the awesome thing about our founding team is that we've all been in the IT support industry for over 15 years, and we've actually built this platform to solve our own problem in our own IT company. Lucas Mycroft, CEO and co-founder of Tribune, and we are automating IT support using artificial intelligence. I'd love to take your questions. All right. Thanks, Lucas. Investors, uh, Mark, we're back to you. Question for Tribune. Yeah, great. Good to meet you, Lucas. Um, one, what... What size and customer is right for you and why? And then two, could you talk a little more about the integrations with the underlying ticketing system like ServiceNow? All right, thanks. Wema, question for Lucas? Yes, uh, how will you deploy the capital? All right, Paige, how about you? Question for Lucas? You still there, Paige? We'll move on to you, Rachel. Question for Lucas. Yeah, um, super competitive space. How are you um, differentiating in your sales page and what's really sticking with customers? All right, thanks. Scott, question for Lucas? Sure, The um, talk a little bit about your land and expand strategy and where you start with a customer and how you can add on to that um, over the coming months um, and years. All right, thanks. Let's take some from the syndicate. Ashwin's asking, are you using the MSP channel as your primary go-to-market? And Gene is asking, how unique is your AI engine? It's sort of a lot, but right. take as many as you can. Two minutes. Thanks very much. Uh, Mark, I'll start with your question around, um, I guess, the, who we're targeting, the size and, and the integration and what it looks like from a service now perspective. Uh, our background is, is completely MSP. Uh, this is the, um, I guess, IT support companies that uh, usually support small organizations from a couple of staff members through to a couple of hundred staff members. Uh, and the MSP themselves are usually five staff to 50 staff. So it's the, it's the lower end of town. ServiceNow are playing the enterprise space. Um, yes, we've had inquiries from the enterprise, but, but that's not our go-to-market strategy right now. We're really focusing on the lower end of town. Um, it's what we know. It's, it's, it's what we've been doing for many, many years. And this might relate to Morales' question around um, where we go to deploy the capital. So 40% goes in sales and marketing, 40% goes on the product. Uh, this is uh, once we raise our first uh, seed round, which is what we're doing now. And honestly, most of our customers that are signing up are in Germany and Netherlands right now. Uh, so we've got a big marketing strategy that we've already launched there. Our marketing strategy in the US goes live uh, next week, actually. Uh, and so, so um, obviously, conventions, conferences, that would be our normal go-to-market strategy. That's not happening in COVID. And so um, we're using traditional marketing methods, digital marketing, uh, and also being everywhere in every MSP forum uh, that we could possibly can be. Which goes into Rachel's question around the community. Community is everything for us. Uh, we don't call them customers, we call them partners because we're actually partnering to help their organization to be more efficient, to, to lower their costs, to add more value to their engineers, to add more value to their customers. And so the community is everything for us. So the, the actual community pages that we're in and the conversations we're having, uh, having with the uh, MSPs themselves, uh, this is the value that, that we're actually uh, building. And we've actually built uh, the Tribute Tribe, um, which is all about bringing our customers on board. And that's where we're getting the feedback. That's where we're understanding what they want. And that's how we're building the, uh, the features and benefits uh, in the platform for them. Uh, around the, uh, I guess uh, I mentioned this before, Scott, around the conventions and marketing. Um, uh, yes, the traditional way with the MSPs and, and typically the nerd uh, conferences that they love going to uh, isn't happening right now. So anyway, I'm out of time. I'd love to answer more questions. I'll jump in the Q&A. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Lucas. All right. And our seventh founder is Pablo from Blush. Okay. Uh, once again, a reoccurring theme, which is we love startups uh, that have um, customers who can't shut up about them and who make really elegant uh, products and 
This product is super elegant and it has uh, reminded me, gave me that little tingle of when I saw Canva uh, or Zendesk and I said, oh, wow, super affordable, super powerful, feels underpriced, right? Uh, and when I see a product for the enterprise that feels underpriced, uh, but that's exceptional, man, that's a great recipe for success because people just pay for it and go, yeah, it's so cheap. Why wouldn't I pay for it? Um, so affordable. Okay. So here we go. Three, two, go. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jason. So hola, I'm Pablo Stanley, designer at Blush, a tool that allows people to discover their creative superpowers. For example, let me tell you about Edgar, who's one of our customers, who is a designer at a startup too. And Edgar just finished the wireframe of a landing page. Look at it. He's ready to turn it into something awesome. So what are his options? He could spend $500 on stock photos, but well, stock photos, yuck. He could hire a photographer, but that's outside his budget and it's kind of hard right now with COVID. Or he could hire an illustrator, but he's in a rush and he doesn't know where to start. So a wise friend tells him about Blush, a tool that allows him to create and customize artwork. It's like Kamba for illustration, he tells him. So Edgar realizes that with Blush, he has so many options in style and themes with illustrations from different artists around the world. Also, he can use this in his tool, in context, and Blush gives him total creative control on every little piece of the art. He can test different things and keep it rating until he gets the artwork that really tells his story. Not only that, he can now invite his team to use Blush too. For example, the marketing team on Google Slides, also his other designer who just prefers using Sketch, and the engineer who just uses web apps. So Edgar and his team were able to turn this into this and all of this for a simple $15 subscription, like Jack Jason said, a little bit of other price maybe. So with Blush, Edgar got an experience that was easy to use, affordable and high quality. Usually good products give you two of these. With Blush, you get the three. Edgar is part of a group of users from which over the last five months, we have seen a consistent growth. We just hit 50K signups and we project 60 by the end of the month. On a road to success in the next couple of years, we'll focus on three things. First, be everywhere. Integrate with every tool makers use. Second, build a strong community, creating the biggest collection of licensed free artwork. And then expand, explore the different things we can do with art and lead the no design movement. So again, be everywhere, build a community and expand. With this focus, we have seen a consistent growth over 160% over the last three months. And our community has just kept growing with over 800 artists on the wait list. And it's not just the numbers. It's also what people say. People love Blush. It allows them to create gorgeous content. Different founders, developers, and creatives rave about it. They tell other people to try it. Our first enterprise account was the Joe Biden campaign, and they love Blush too. See what Robin says. What took three hours can now take five minutes. We believe that stuff is really powerful. This is our founding team. We met an ambition where we built easy to use design tools. And don't worry, we got the blessing from the CEO, Clara Wahlberg, who is also one of our investors. This is our fully remote team and I'm just super proud of them. I'm Pablo Stanley and we're Blush. We want people to discover their creative superpowers. Muchas gracias. All right, thanks Pablo, well done. Um, Vinny, do you have a question for Pablo? How do I stop sharing? <laughs> Sorry, how do I stop sharing? <laughs> I cannot um, find the tool to stop sharing. <laughs> it's all right. Well, let's keep going. Oh, here it is. <laughs> you got it? You okay, uh, Pablo? All right. Hey, Pablo. It's a very, very cool product, actually. Um, so does it mean I want to understand the economics of the of the business. You guys create all your own art designs, et cetera. Is that something you do? You're not licensing from everyone, you're not paying any fees. So you basically like just explain to you the margins of this business better. Thanks. All right, thanks. Alexandra, question for Pablo. Yeah, uh, piggybacking off of Vinny's question, how are you building the, the library of, of illustrations and, and content for, for your site? I think that would uh, better help me understand uh, a bit. Thank you. Thanks. Allison? Great job. I, I think right now, illustration is is trendy and the, the examples that you showed, I, they, um, you know, I've seen things like that elsewhere. How do you plan to adjust, adjust and adopt to when, you know, visual tastes will inevitably change? Thanks. Andrew? 
I'm interested to know um, specifically related to uh, this market, whether depth of creation matters. For example, if there's particular use cases such as like, you know, creating a website or just doing icons or what is the, the, the key um, product feature that is being used the most and where you think that will be in the future. Okay, thanks. I think we had two similar questions. So Ben, do you have a question for Pablo? I would like to understand the pre-existing TAM between photography, stock photography and illustration, uh, understanding that you can expand the total market just today in terms of creative content elements, what that looks like, how many dollars are spent on photography versus illustration. All right, thanks. And uh, let's grab one from the syndicate. Um, how do you pay the designers, Jordan is asking. Try to get as many as you can in two minutes, Pablo. Okay, cool. Okay, Vinny, economics of the business. Who creates the art and what are the fees? Uh, so different artists are creating the art. Uh, they, uh, they, they applied. Uh, a lot of them, we actually uh, contacted them. And uh, our first cohort of illustrators, we actually paid them. We, uh, we hired them uh, to create all the illustrations. Uh, and uh, now we're moving forward to uh, something where it allows them to uh, have some revenue share model and also do some upsell. So that's uh, something that we are uh, working with illustrators to, to see what is the, the, the right uh, way to get them to also have some income, some passive income coming from, from Blush. Alexander, how, how are you building the library of illustrations? Uh, again, uh, illustrators are applying. We're working with them. We are creating a like uh, one of the most important things for us is just like creating the community. So uh, we are creating the community of different artists that are helping each other. Like we are, I'm an illustrator myself. We have illustrators on staff. We're just like helping them create all the systems and just like creating all the computation and all the learning platform for them to understand how to create systems. Illustration is trendy. How do you plan to adjust and adapt? We create the trends and that's the power of community because like we're not going to be following the trends. We're actually going to be creating them and from Blush is going to be coming all of that. And Andrew, depth of creation, what is the key product feature? Right now, is it's really just like a, the idea that you can use illustrations on anything. We have seen a, a depth of like people just like using it for social media content, for marketing content, but also just like on their landing pages, on their depths. We've seen developers actually using it, just like using the embed code uh, for uh, like actually loading it and knowing that, that it's like always going to be on, uh, the, the, the best resolution is going to be there in the code without uh, gathering a lot of uh, weight and performance on their side. Also, Ben, uh, how, how do you pay the designers? This was coming from the syndicate. Uh, like I was saying, I, again, we're like our first cohort of illustrators, we hire them. Now we're moving in towards like uh, something where uh, there's a revenue share model or something where they can actually uh, sell some of their uh, uh, expansion packs on top of the illustrations that they already created. And I'm happy oh. to take more questions later. Great job. Thanks, Pablo. Okay. That was our cohort, our seven great founders. Um, the, now comes the hard part. We're going to ask you to give us your number three, your number two, and your number one. The way that we'll do it is I'll, I'll go around and call in folks, much like the questions in first name alphabetical order, asking you for your number three and your number two. And when you give us your number three and number two, just say the name of the company, but then also say your number one and why, why you pick them for number one. Yeah, um, half a point to number three full point to number two and two points to number one. We add up those points and we track them over the course of the accelerator, uh, which gives the founders feedback on both um, how they're doing versus their contemporaries. And then also which investors uh, like which startups, which is good in terms of investor product, investor founder fit, which is super important in our industry. Thanks for coming everybody. I really do appreciate it. Um, if you're watching and you're not yet an investor and uh, you're on the public stream over on YouTube, I saw there were 500 people over there. Um, please try the products and tweet about them and maybe apply for a job at these companies. Uh, there's great ways for you to be involved. And if you're an investor, you know, if you like one or two of these companies and you want to spend time with them, just contact them directly. Uh, they, we put their names and their contact information in your email box and in the chat room and founder spell love T-I-M-E. So just give them a little bit of your time and spend some time with them, get to know them, give them some good advice um, and root for them. It's not easy to build companies and it's super important right now for our economy that these founders are out there fighting the good fight and building companies and creating jobs. So with that, Jackie, let's find out what the <laughs> number three, two, and one. Sorry, yeah. I'm really excited. I know. And Vinny, I know so. Vinny's, looking, Vinny's looking good. He's got that tonal in the back. I saw that tonal, Vinny. I see what you're doing there. Cannons are coming back, Vinny. Got the guns. 
also want to let the syndicate members know that after after we do this go around with the, with our judges here, we'll also do a poll for the syndicate too, so we can get oh, your set choices. Yeah, so we'll okay. get that we'll get that ready. Um, and so we'll start with Alexandra. Are you ready, Alexandra, to give me your three, your two, and your number one? If you need more time, then you can tell me that. <laughs> yep, I'm I'm ready to go. <laughs> okay, so three three two just company, and then one and why. Three, Amelia, two, uh, Tribute, one, Palabra, uh, I think a great affordable solution for uh, the growing e-commerce world. All right, great, thanks. And Precious Keeping Score. Um, Allison, your three, two, one, and why, please. Three, Tribute, two, Blush, and one, Palabra. Very similar to Alexandra. You know, anyone can create their own store now. I, we have a big thesis at Newark Venture Partners around the you know, boom of e-commerce and the technologies needed around that. I think it, it fits really nicely. All right. Thanks, Allison. Andrew, your three, two, one, and why, please. Uh, three is uh, remote hour. Um, two is blush. And one is sip. Um, I think that, uh, you know, uh, the world of um, video conferencing can still continue. And I love um, seeing things built within designer first platforms. But uh, the thing that really takes the cake is that like now you can get effectively like a birch box for alcohol, uh, which wasn't available before because of regulation. So we can all have a really good time at home and sample all the champagne that we could possibly want at the touch of a button. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, ben, you're a three, two, one, and why, please? Sure, three, remote hour, more likely because I'd use it and then I would invest in it. Uh, two, Rollbot, almost got it number one, but I've lost a lot of money in that category. It takes forever and I hate selling to the HR team. And Tribu AI for number one, I believe that the number of people since all laggards have ended their lives and are now embracing technology, the need for more support for anything related to the technology stack is gonna just continue to grow. And having a way to do it in a more automated form will open that up for lots of different types of businesses. All right, awesome. Um, David, I'm going to ask you for your top three, but um, Prash, take note. Um, fortunately, the votes can't count because I think, David, you missed the first pitch, um, but would still like to know your top three regardless. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Number three, remote hour. Number two would be tribute, and number one would be blush. Uh, you know, I think it's a good sign I'm on signing up for blush right now to try it out. So, you know. All right. Great job. Thanks. Um, Jonathan, you're three, two, one, and why, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, Palabra for three, remote hour two, uh, blush for one. I'm, I, I, Allison asked the question perfectly. I'm really concerned, like what happens when the design trend changes and moves away from illustrations, which are really hot right now? What happens next year when that's not the trend? But uh, in its current form, while they are hot, seems like a cool idea. I'm just curious what the future holds. All right, thanks. Hey, Jackie, sorry to jump in here. Do you want me to launch the poll right now so we could start getting some results by the time the investors are done with their three, two, ones? I think we could do it at the end. Okay. Yeah, thanks for asking that, Nick. Mm -hmm. um, Keith. Yeah, um, three is Tribu, uh, two is Palabra, and one, I haven't lost any money there yet. Um, so hopefully if we get to invest in, in Robot, uh, we won't, but Robot is number one. Um, and I think the reason is the use case of I want to clone this employee or this person is such a powerful one. Nobody solved it yet, um, but this this looks like it's taking a couple of first baby steps there, and and I think um, can be a, a very powerful tool for HR teams. So, all right, great, thanks, Keith. Okay, so we have before we get out, we have five more to go, but let's take a tally so far. What are our scores so far, Presh? All right, in first place we've got Palabra with five point five. Second place, we've got a tie with Blush and Tribute at four points. And third place, we've got Rollbot with three points. Okay, it's pretty wide open. Mark, you're a three, two, one, and why, please? Yeah, so first of all, good job, everybody. A lot of my ranking will come down to fit with what we're focused on as a firm right now. So number three was Blush. Number two, Tribute. We have four Australian investments. We love Brisbane. And number one was uh, Palabra. Um, and the reason it was number one for me is because I, I think there are a wide range of really compelling use cases and we love the bottom up, uh, you know, way to, way to grow the business. All right. Thanks, Mark. Wema. Yes. Uh, number three is Palabra. 
Uh, number two was Blush, and number one is uh, Tribute, coming from the technology risk management space. Um, that is the future. All right, terrific. Uh, Rachel, your three, two, one, and why, please? Sure. Uh, three was Palabra, two was Rollbot, and number one was Blush. I think it's a super innovative product. Um, we use a lot of illustrations on our team, and having seen the pain points and the time it takes to produce those assets, I, I just think it's a really valuable product. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Scott, your three, two, one, and why, please? <clears throat> sure. Number three was Tribute. Number two um, is Remote Hour, and number one is Palabra. Um, the notion of enabling small business owners, medium-sized business owners, um, and democratizing the ability to leverage technology are themes that are going to play out for decades to come. So very impressive. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Scott. <clears throat> and it all comes down to you, Vinny. Your three, two, one, and why, please. Um, okay, so <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna give remote hour number three. Um, I'm gonna give uh, Palabra two and Blush one. Um, Blush really for me is a it solves a huge problem uh, in in sort of prototyping, design, etc. I hate uh, I hate stock photos, and the only reason it's in that order and not promote our little higher up is. Because I, I have, you know, I, I'm actually involved with a stealth competitor for remote hour, so I think that the space is really interesting. I think it's a lot bigger than people think. Um, and it's time to be... jump teams, Vinny. Time to jump teams. Sorry. <laughs> time to switch teams. Switch teams. Oh. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm texting you about it, Jason. We haven't connected yet, but that's what it was about. I know. I know. Uh, oh, okay. Well, good that good that we didn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, how are you liking the tone? You like it? I love it. Tunnels. I use the tunnel uh, two or three times a week. It's fantastic. Yeah, amazing device. Getting better too. It's great. Yeah. It's, it's Did yours amazing. get recalled by the way? No. Mm. <laughs> I had one of the first ones. They, they just swapped it out mysteriously. It didn't explain why. Oh, we're like, right. yeah, we're replacing these units. I was like, oh, is there a recall? They're like, no, uh, uh, no, we don't know. <laughs> I was like, but you're I got mine I got mine just for lockdowns. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I think that maybe the original ones, maybe there was some issue, but they weren't transparent about it, but it's a great device. All right, Jackie, All right, how do we so, wind up? Yeah, Press, let us know who won. Top three. All right. In first place, Palabra with 11.5 points. Second place, Blush with 9.5. And third place, Tribu with 7.5. I hope that I didn't have any influence on this with my introductions, Jackie, because I usually don't <laughs> do the introductions every week. And I'm, I'm, I was trying to be equally Chips effusive. fall where they may about each company <laughs> and i thought i did a pretty good job of being equally effusive about all of them uh, but we're really excited about these companies oh. and uh let's launch our poll now oh what the poll yes launch yeah. the poll great so you know, I, the only thing is we might want to launch the poll i'm trying to think about when to launch the poll so it has the least amount so, of oh, influence. so they don't well i i don't know i think these syndicate members because then you could have the influence go the other way <laughs> yeah no i know but there is it's subtle that, but. that's true you're gonna Who's have gonna influence, influence either way yeah all right Let's uh, everybody vote quickly, please vote quickly. <laughs> and then uh, we'll go from there. It's good. If you have 24 um, seconds. No, take, take your time. Um, if you uh, have great companies, you can email me anytime. Jason at calacanis.com or slide into my DMs on Twitter, Jason uh, or Jackie at launch.co uh, or Presh at launch.co and launch.co slash apply. We spend 16 weeks with these companies in the program. And then the rest of the year uh, in that first year, helping them raise money, I'd say, Right now, two or three companies are raising money during the accelerator. Then two or three raise it like right after they kind of close right after. And then one or two tend to wait, uh, maybe hit some more milestones and raise later in the year of uh, that first year. But man, the hit rate has been pretty amazing since we went into COVID. Um, and one of the features here is we don't do any high pressure sales tactics. We're not trying to uh, pressure you into making a decision today. We don't counsel the... Um, founders, uh, to the extent we can counsel them, start companies, but uh, we don't counsel them to, um, you know, play kind of games about the valuations raising every other week and exploding notes and uncapped notes and all this nonsense. We tell them from week one, start meeting with investors and whichever investors want to invest, if you vibe with them, take their money and get to know people and have a great relationship and play the long game. So we're kind of unspinning a lot of the spin you might experience at other accelerators that put high pressure tactics on people. We do the opposite. Uh, if you come to the first week or first six weeks of the accelerator, 
maybe the pitches are a little less refined because they're, you know, kind of getting that reaction and the pitching process and getting questions from VCs tends to create a little bit of clarity on the part of founders about what is important in their business. So that's a nice um, secondary feature of the uh, process of pitching your company 16 times to, you know, a dozen to 200 investors, you get a lot of great feedback. Uh, and by the end, they meet 500 investors. So if a company is not fundable after 500 investors, it's because they chose to not take funding um, or the world doesn't appreciate their brilliance yet, or uh, it's possibly just not a venture backed company. And, you know, we got it wrong as investors, maybe. Um, and and that, I, that is possible. Um, it could happen, I guess. Um, but it's been a great experience and we have the numbers. I'm going to end the poll. Okay. End the poll. All right. Oh, oh my lord, tie? look at that. <laughs> I don't oh, think I've seen that happen oh, before. <laughs> whoa. Oh my lord. That's first. Look at that. Pablo is going crazy. He's just got out of the shower, washing his hair. What is going on with that virtual backgrounds? But oh my lord. Wow. Okay. Tie, palabra, and blush. Mm -hmm. Palabra and brush with the tie. The 29 votes robot. each. Unbelievable. Robot, robot second. Yeah. All right, everybody. We'll see you so, next time. Thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being bye -bye. here.